All right. Thank you, Dr. Vaughn. So welcome everybody to our weekly grand rounds. Um, today, I have the honor of introducing um, one of our fourth year residents, so Dr. Sergio Flores. Um, so Dr. Flores um, went to UCLA for undergrad where he studied psychobiology. Um, he then came to UCSF for medical school and then quickly became integrated in the uh, orthopedics department here. Um, he's worked with um, us in the sports group, especially, um, as well as other groups, but um, he's done um, quite a lot of research, um, hip arthroscopy, database studies, uh, meniscus studies, um, numerous others. And um, he uh, was AOA as a medical student, um, really excelled. And then we were fortunate to have him match with us, match with us here at UCSF. Um, he's uh, continued on an excellent path um, as a resident. Um, he's currently uh, or finished applying and interviewing for a sports fellowship and is a future uh, sports medicine surgeon and future colleague. So uh, today, Dr. Flores is going to be um, speaking to us about um, arthroscopy in low and middle income countries. Um, with his partner, Nicolina, one of his interests during residency has been traveling. He's been able to travel to numerous different countries that have uh, really impacted his perspective. And then uh, I know in corresponding with him during his um, international rotation, uh, he was really struck by um, arthroscopy in the low income setting. And uh, he's uh, bringing that to us today. So Dr. Flores, thank you for presenting today and look forward to your talk. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for that kind introduction, Dr. Lansdowne. Um, this topic was inspired by my time on the global rotation. Uh, I hope it's uh, inspiring for all of you, as it was for me. My goals for this talk are to give a brief history of the UCSF resident global rotation, to share my experience on my global rotation at Abu and Billy Orthopedic Institute in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, to discuss arthroscopy in low and middle income countries, including its challenges and future directions. And finally, I hope to inspire all trainees in the audience to participate in their global rotation. My only relevant disclosure is I am not an expert in global health. This talk is solely an interpretation of my own experience, and I have no conflicts of interest with implant industry, although I will mention a few companies throughout my talk. I'll start with a brief history of the creation of the UCSF Resident Global Elective and IGOT, the Institute for Global Orthopedics and Traumatology. IGOT was founded in 2006 by Dr. Coughlin, Jurgensen, and Goslin, along with a group of UCSF residents uh, to expand international outreach and address disparities in global orthopedic trauma. Their mission is to build capacity in musculoskeletal care through global partnerships. Their main focus is on surgical education, research, advocacy, and leadership. One of the unique parts of the UCSF residency program is the long-standing commitment to sending residents on global rotations. This started when Dr. Coughlin introduced residents to global orthopedics through Operation Rainbow, a foundation focusing on short-term orthopedic surgery service trips to Central and South America. Starting in 1992, he brought dozens of UCSF residents on these trips. Then in 1997, Dr. Coughlin developed a partnership with the Bedford Orthopedic Center in South Africa to send UCSF residents on global rotation. This was initially funded by an OREF grant, then it became an official resident rotation through UCSF. Over 44 residents rotated through this site. Since the development of the global rotation, residents have also rotated in Ghana, Malawi, Nepal, Nicaragua, and Tanzania. Currently, UCSF offers rotations in Ghana and Tanzania with the possibility of reopening and ex or expanding sites. IGOT has developed a strong partnership with the Muhambili Orthopedic Institute and has sent 34 residents to Tanzania. Many other medical students, including IGOT research fellows, have also had the opportunity to visit these sites. Most people who have been on these rotations have described it as a highlight of their education. You may recognize some familiar faces of former residents on their global rotations who may or may not be attendings at our institution. In 2023, Dr. Senyo from Ghana and Drs. George and Patrick from Tanzania visited UCSF as part of the SF, SF, ZSFG Observership. This highlights the bi-directionality of IGOT partnerships with Ghana and Tanzania. Before we move on, I want to bring up the World Bank classification of a country's income used to define each country's economic status. The gross national income, or GNI per capita, 
is defined in simple terms as the dollar value of a country's final income per year divided by the population. Low and lower middle income countries are frequently combined as LMICs and high income countries are defined as HIC. I'll use these uh, referenced abbreviations throughout my talk. Here are the low and lower middle income global economies. My talk will mostly focus mostly on Tanzania, which has recently moved for, from low income to lower middle income. We have found that it is almost universally beneficial for HIC residents to do a global rotation in an LMIC. However, it's important to think about what effect we are having on the host site by sending residents there. The IGOT team did some great work on this topic, led by Claire Donnelly, former IGOT fellow, and Heather Roberts, former UCSF resident. In the two studies, they sent surveys to both HIC resident rotators and LMIC hosts to evaluate the motivations and perceived impacts of these rotations by both visitors and hosts. This graph shows the agreement with the statement, visiting residents have an overall positive impact on the host institution, with the gray and orange colors indicating strongly agree or agree. The vast majority of host trainees agree with that statement, while a greater percentage of host faculty were neutral or disagree. Based on these studies, global rotations may be beneficial for host countries who have trainees, where they can be an exchange of knowledge. Visiting residents should come prepared and be respectful of the host patients and trainees. Now I want to move on to discuss my own experience at Muhambili Orthopedic Institute, or MOI, in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. First, I'll give an overview of Tanzania to gain a better understanding of the country and how orthopedic education is structured. Then I'll share a day in the life of a resident and, and my experience on the rotation. Tanzania is in sub-Saharan Africa. It was colonized by Britain and Germany and gained its independence as a sovereign state in 1964. The current capital is Dodoma, and the national language is Swahili, although English is taught at higher levels of education. The population is 65 million people, and the GNI per capita is $1,200, classifying it as a low middle income country. Dar es Salaam is the largest city in Tanzania, sitting on the coast near Zanzibar. It's a beautiful city with amazing culture, restaurants, and things to do. The population of Dar es Salaam is over 2.7 million people, with even a larger number of people living in the surrounding area. There are three orthopedic surgery residencies in Tanzania. Moonville Orthopedic Institute is, is the largest. The path to becoming an orthopedic surgeon is long. It includes going to undergrad and medical school for six years. Next, they work as a registrar, our equivalent to the service years as a resident. It is common to work two or more years as a registrar prior to starting residency, and some registrars uh, don't make it to become a resident. After three years of residency, you become a specialist, or our equivalent of a junior attending. Specialists may further their training with a fellowship or observership, usually outside of Tanzania, although this is a rare occurrence. Over time, working as a specialist, you become a consultant or a senior attending. Moi is part of a larger national public hospital system, and their focus is on orthopedics and neurosurgery. Many specialists work at Moi and supplement their work at local private hospitals to increase their income, often working six days a week. There are 54 residents at Moi, with 18 in each class. The residency is similar to a master's program in the U.S., where you have to pay money to be a resident. They pay about $7,000 U.S. dollars a year. Government stipends are available, but not guaranteed. The ortho department is split into three large teams with over 30 attendings. Now I'll share a day in the life of a visiting resident. Similar to our ZSFG County experience, their morning starts with fractured conference. Almost every former or current resident in this room can relate to that feeling of standing up on the podium, presenting consults and getting grilled by your attendings. The burden of trauma and open fractures is high, and it was common for the team to be operating all night. Unlike our U.S. programs, their residency does not have duty hour restrictions. So after they present their consults, they return to the OR to finish the cases they brought in that day and overnight, and at times they can be working up to 48 hours a shift. After fracture conference, there was usually time for breakfast, which I took advantage of. Uh, this was my typical breakfast of parathas and samosas in the morning. 
In clinic, we saw all types of pathology, including some very complex cases. Patients travel far for their appointments and often wait hours to be seen. Rounds are held once a week by each team. It's a large group of attendings, residents, registrars, and nurses seeing every patient on the ward. The hospital has some private rooms, but typically patients would stay in these larger open wards with up to 12 beds in each section. It is common to see patients in external fixation, traction, or with open fractures. I often ask, they, are, they often asked my opinion on how we would manage things in the United States. Patients have to pay for every aspect of their care, even if they have some form of insurance. If patients couldn't pay for their final definitive surgery, they generally have to wait on the wards until payment could be provided. Similar to our post-operative conference at UCSF, we discussed challenges, learning pearls, and what could be done differently next time. This is an x-ray of a Montasia fracture that was fixed without using CR. I found this flyer on the men's locker room door that was advertising research enrollment in the gentamicin open tibia or go tibia study, a collaboration with UCSF and Moy. Moving on to the ORs, there are two OR locations in the hospital. The first is in the trauma or emergency OR, which is attached to the emergency department. And this is where they do their same day open fracture and trauma surgeries. There are no CRMs available in these ORs. There's additional six elective rooms in the main hospital. The image on the right is what that looks like, where there's five beds set up um, in consecutive order without walls dividing each OR. There are usually one to two specialists and one to two residents assigned to each case with the consulting attending in charge of each room. They also host visiting specialists from other countries. For example, one specialist from Rwanda was doing a year-long pelvis and acetabulum trauma fellowship during my time there. This is a sample case log of procedures I saw during my time at Moy. This isn't a comprehensive list, but as you can see, they are doing cases across all subspecialties. I went into the rotation thinking I was going to be mostly doing trauma, but when I arrived, I found there was a large volume of elective cases. Almost all lower extremity cases are done under spinal anesthesia and with the patient wide awake. The first case I scrubbed into was a total knee arthroplasty with Professor Billy Huanga. Luckily, I remembered most of Dr. Hansen's steps, uh, so I was prepared for Billy's questions during the case. Bovies are also reused and placed in sterile sleeves during the case. However, I found that it was a rare occurrence to be able to have a, uh, the ability to use a bovi. If we encountered a bleeding vessel during the case, we would take a schnitt, clamp the vessel, and keep moving. Even complex cases had to adapt to the availability of implants and equipment. This was a chronic Achilles rupture right at the tendon bone interface. They repaired it using a VY lengthening and transosseous bone tunnels on the calcaneus. I'd never seen a VY lengthening, and neither had the surgeon performing the case. Fortunately, there were a lot of people around, and another attending came by and explained how they would do it in real time. I asked if they would consider using suture anchors to fix it. However, they noted it was too expensive for the patient to afford, and they had limited access to this equipment. Here is an example of cases from one of my days in the OR. The first case was a proximal tibia open reduction internal fixation with the plate and screws. And the second case was a tibial nail. For those who aren't familiar, as I was not before my trip, SIGN is a program that helps provide intramedullary nail systems to LMIC hospitals. The nails are designed to be able to fix long bone fractures without using CRM x-ray. The surgeon performs an open reduction and provisionally holds the fracture reduced with clamps. Next, they hand ream and then place the nail. The jig lines up with the proximal and distal interlocking screws. However, the sign trays at Moy were old, and most of the time the distal interlocking screws missed, and we'd have to visually look through our drill hole to see if we could line it up with the fracture nail. Since I'm interested in sports, I was pleasantly surprised by the volume of arthroscopy cases they were performing at Moy. For those listening who aren't familiar, arthroscopy means to look within a joint by using a camera to help perform a surgical procedure. Although we were able to perform arthroscopy of many joints, I will focus on knee and shoulder arthroscopy and discuss the current state of arthroscopy at Moy. During my first week at Moy, I met Dr. Francis Itaru during a femoral nail. 
He asked me what I was interested in, and I said I was applying to sports fellowships. He invited me to join them during their Friday cases. I did an ACL reconstruction with him and Dr. Joseph Savas. After that day, I gravitated towards their ORs, and they took me under their wing. The sports team is led by Dr. Felix Amricha uh, on the far right of the picture. Most of them have completed sports fellowships or observerships in India or Egypt. They all learn from each other, and they are training their own specialists as well who have an interest in arthroscopy, an example of their informal fellowship. Dr. Marisha is also the president of the Tanzania Orthopedic Association, and they host conferences similar to our national conferences in the U.S. The first arthroscopy at Moy was performed in 2000 by Dr. Nungu on the upper right of the screen. He did many international observerships and brought arthroscopy to Moy. The picture on the left is the scope tower we used during my first week on the rotation with a desktop monitor sized screen. The picture on the right was the first shoulder arthroscopy done at Moy, a subacromial decompression when Dr. Stephanie Wong did her rotation as a resident in 2017. Here are examples of sports cases we performed. We did a full range of cases including ACL, MCL, and MPL fell reconstruction, distal femur osteotomies. And most meniscus surgeries were meniscectomies because they did not have the implants available for doing all inside or inside out repair. Frequently, patients had MRIs, but if they didn't, we would perform an EUA and a diagnostic arthroscopy if, lig if ligamentous injury was suspected. They did not have the implants at MOI to do shoulder arthroscopy, including rotator cuff repair and instability, but they can perform their procedures at private hospitals where implants are available. One limitation is the cost of implants and the availability of the patient, uh, the ability of the patient to pay for the implant. Examples of single use items they reuse are shavers, arthroscopy tubing, and suctions that are sterilized in between cases. I wanted to share how we did an ACL reconstruction at Moy. Like any case, it starts with prepping and draping the leg. Uh, we would wear classic aprons to protect our scrubs from fluid soaking through the cloth gowns. They use gravity flow for the scope with small 500cc bottles of sterile normal saline hanging from the IV pole that had to be changed every 10 to 15 minutes. This was usually the job of the registrar or the resident, and at times I was, when I was observing, I was frequently the one changing uh, the fluid. I quickly learned that the word maji means water. Their steps were similar to how we do hamstring autograft at UCSF. They harvested the gracilis in MIT, and then they used a graft master to prepare it. They would freehand the femoral tunnel pin through an anterior medial portal and then use a drill guide for the tibial tunnel. They have a creative solution for pulling the button and graft up the femoral tunnel using sterile, strong fishing wire instead of expensive sutures. Their tibial fixation is with a metal interference screw. One practice difference with, arth was, um, with arthroscopy was they placed strains in every patient and admitted um, the patients overnight. When I asked the reasoning for it, they noted it decreased pain and swelling, and that's the way they've always been doing it. I'm grateful for the local surgeons for letting me participate in our, their cases. They're impressed that I knew how to perform arthroscopy skills as a resident. To be respectful of the Moy residents, I would only scrub in once invited by an attending surgeon, and the residents that I would take turns scrubbing if it was too crowded. One time while scrubbed in with another resident, I was able to walk her through a diagnostic scope while they were preparing the ACL graft. My favorite day of the rotation was when we started using their newly donated refurbished arthroscopy tower. It was such an amazing feeling to watch them perform surgery on these large HD monitors when we previously had a small desktop sized screen. The day was documented by a photographer so they could share their new equipment and everyone was so happy that day. The last week of my rotation, I gave a talk on ACL injuries to the department. Little did I know I would be lecturing to a group of United Kingdom knee surgeons who had arrived that day. <laughs> Ironically, these UK surgeons had to listen to a resident from California give a talk on a topic they were experts in. Their story of choosing to spend time at Moy was interesting. They met during different stages of training and now teach an industry-sponsored course in London every year. One of them previously spent time in Malawi, and they wanted to organize a trip together to East Africa. They had a contact in Tanzania, which connected them to Moy. The eight surgeons spent 10 days in the hospital focusing on education and performing surgeries, including knee arthroscopy, meniscus repair, ACL reconstruction, and osteotomies. They donated, 
They donated over $2 million of equipment, including the three refurbished arthroscopy towers and various sports implants. Two of the reps from Smith and Nephew came as well to help check out the condition of their donated towers and teach the scrub techs how to use the sets and new equipment. The visiting surgeons gave lectures and performed cases with the local Moy surgeons. They taught them techniques such as lateral extraarticular tendinitis or LET and various meniscus repair techniques. I could tell the visiting surgeons at first had a culture shock of the OR environment, not unsimilar to mine. Two of them had a down a site visit a couple years ago, but for many of them, it was their first time visiting an LMIC. After their first couple days, they started incorporating the local surgeons more into the cases. Here is an example of a case of the visiting residents and local surgeons performed together. Dr. Joseph Savas in the light green was performing an ACL reconstruction and getting their perspective on femoral tunnel placement and when to perform an LET. They also held indications conferences and discussed their post-operative care, like placement of drains. After the UK surgeon's visit, Moy surgeons changed their practice of placing drains and now independently perform LETs to augment their ACL reconstructions. After speaking with the Moy attendings, they felt like overall the UK surgeon's visit was a positive experience due to the education and donation of equipment. The UK team plans to return in one to two years. Historically, global orthopedic efforts have focused on fracture care, infection, deformity, and congenital musculoskeletal conditions, while pathologies that could benefit from arthroscopy have received less attention. Given my exposure to arthroscopy during my time at Moy and with the UK surgeons visiting, I started wondering about the state of arthroscopy in LMICs. This paper published in JVGS shared the author's experience of donating equipment and teaching arthroscopy to orthopedic surgeons in Eritrea. At that time in 2009, there were not many articles discussing arthroscopy in low and middle income countries. However, with countries' economies growing and the rise of sports leading to musculoskeletal injuries, arthroscopy is becoming more and more popular. The article focused on going to teach arthroscopy rather than just donating equipment. Important questions they ask are when to introduce arthroscopy, and they noted it is appropriate to consider both political and socioeconomic stability, availability and number of orthopedic surgeons, skill level, and the capacity for postoperative rehab. Additionally, what are the ethics behind introducing arthroscopy? We all know that sports surgeries are great. They improve quality of life, <laughs> but they aren't life or limb saving. Are there enough surgeons to perform arthroscopy cases so it doesn't divert essential surgeries like trauma, infection, and limb salvage? Where does arthroscopy fall under elective surgery? And with the concepts of justice and do good, introducing arthroscopy would make the procedure more equitable to those around the world who would benefit from it. I laughed when I saw this table the authors created about the elective tiers in orthopedics. Notably, they argue that soft tissue repair and arthroscopy should be in a higher elective tier than arthroplasty and spine surgery. This is probably still up for debate, but I think we all know a few people who may or may not agree with this table. A second question to ask is, is there a need for arthroscopy in LMICs? Will people benefit from it? The short answer to this question is yes. This 2018 study in the Journal of Epidemiology utilizes World Health Organization, or WHO, data from local surveys to estimate the number of adolescent sports injuries in Africa among 13 to 17-year-olds. They, they estimated there to be almost 23 million injuries per year in this age group. The nature of injury also differs in low- and middle-income countries, as the location and quality of playing surfaces where adolescents get injured is usually influenced by poor infrastructure and trauma. Additionally, injuries may be frequently missed or have delay in care due to various factors like access to care, imaging, surgeon skill, and availability. In a study in Nepal, most ACL injuries occurred via trauma, and the second most common cause in rural areas was farming incidents. This differs from the U.S. where most ligamentous injuries usually occur while playing sports. There are additional studies that are trying to identify the incidence of ligamentous and sports injuries in Africa, but there is still a lot of work to be done. A third question to ask is, do local surgeons want to learn arthroscopy? This study in the Journal of Surgical Education performed a survey during the Haitian Annual Assembly for Orthopedic Trauma, the orthopedic um, CMA conference in Haiti. They surveyed local surgeons on skills they want to develop. 
Patient attendings and residents rated themselves as novices in arthroscopy and rated as the highest desired skill improvement they wanted to learn compared with closed reductions, fasciotomies, external fixation, and internal fixation. This study, published in the Pan-African Medical Journal, highlights the extent of arthroscopy training for residents in a resource-constrained environment in Nigeria. Their arthroscopy training is mostly lecture-based, with limited lab or cadaver training and no simulation. Most of the trainings, trainees in the study were not confident in arthroscopy basics such as forming portals nor performing a diagnostic scope. These results were similar to my own experience with the Moy residents' comfort levels with arthroscopy. They concluded that in Nigeria, most training centers do not have adequate case volume to give them exposure in arthroscopy. They noted training cha- additional challenges such as the lack of equipment and training facilities, the high cost of arthroscopy procedures, and only having few surgeons trained to perform arthroscopy. They provided their own recommendations uh, for improved training, including establishing a formal arthroscopy division, structured labs, sponsored rotations, and the need for more equipment like arthroscopy towers. Based on the Nigerian residents' desire for more training, I wanted to highlight the theme of arthroscopy education. Arthroscopy is definitely a skill that can, in theory, benefit from some simulation or cadaver training before performing on a patient. The challenge in a resource-constrained environment is how can we provide similar simulation to practice arthroscopy skills in a cost-effective manner. This randomized controlled trial focused on teaching arthroscopy basics in Haiti during the annual conference using simulation. There are 40 participants who are randomized to receive instruction through a simulator with the video, the control group, or a video and hands-on teaching by a visiting surgeon, the intervention group. 80% were residents, and only 22% had experienced uh, arthroscopy before the study. Both groups improved pre- and post-intervention, but the intervention group seemed to reach higher levels. There are limitations to the study, as simulation does not equate to operative experience, and this, these simulators are expensive, costing about $3,400 each. Overall, it seems that with some expert instruction, these residents performed better. However, it's not clear if that translates to clinical improvements in the OR. There are creative ways to build your own arthroscopy simulation in a resource-limited setting by doing a DIY or do-it-yourself project. These papers give instructions on how to build a low-cost simulator using various tools, even via FaceTime or video calling. Although simulation doesn't exactly substitute a true surgery experience, it can help establish important hand-eye coordination skills that are unique to arthroscopy. Finally, the main question we should ask is, is arthroscopy sustainable and how do we build capacity in LMICs? Capacity building is an approach to global healthcare that creates independence through infrastructure development, sustainability, and enhanced problem solving while taking context into account. It is recognized by the WHO and is cited as a goal for global outreach organizations and NGOs. Dr. Shapiro has done a lot of work on this topic, and this paper provides a framework with seven domains for capacity building in global orthopedic surgical outreach. The framework do- domains include partnerships, professional development, governance, community impact, and finance that are based on a foundation of culture and coordination. Each theme builds on itself with an assessment and engagement that leads to implementation, normalization, and finally, independence and in self-sustaining practices. Similarly, the IGOT team, led by former IGOT fellows Kelsey Brown and our own resident Michael Flores, published an article in JBGS on best practices for establishing academic international partnerships. There is a need for high-quality research to be, to be performed in low- and middle-income countries, and partnerships can help facilitate this research. They give best practices to develop these partnerships and maintain them, such as including partners as authors on publications and providing support for presenting research at international conferences, as these two grants highlight. In the paper, they argue that research performed in high-income countries is difficult to generalize to low- and middle-income countries due to differences in target population, disparities in training, access, infrastructure, and equipment availability. This paper on outcomes of ACL reconstruction in Nepal gives an example of this in the sports literature. They compared outcomes of 194 patients who underwent ACL reconstruction with hamstring autograft in an urban versus uh, rural setting in Nepal. 
they found complication rates higher in the rural group. An editorial article in the International Society of Arthroscopy, Knee Surgery, and Orthopedic Sports Medicine highlights the group's work saying that this isn't just another ACL paper and research in limited uh, resource environments should be encouraged. Dr. Rai won the Young Investigator Award at the ISACAS meeting in 2017 for this work and got to visit Dr. Moose Hall in Pittsburgh. This is an example that training, collaboration, and mentorships can positively influence academic research productivity in a limited resource setting. Now I want to discuss insights into both our opportunities and challenges of building sustainable arthroscopy and LMICs. This qualitative research study is the framework for establishing sustainable arthroscopy capacity in LMICs. The work was led by Erica Von Kapler, a former IGOT fellow, Dr. Dave Atkin, a former UCSF resident who runs Operation Rainbow and serves as an ad- advisor on IGOT's board, and Dr. Morshed and Dr. Shear. They conducted interviews with stakeholders in successful and unsuccessful arthroscopy partnerships around the world. Their goal was to find the key ingredients to success and challenges of building arthroscopy capacity in these low resource settings. LMIC sites are highlighted in red on the map and HIC partners were from the U.S. and Switzerland. 56% of LMIC respondents had completing some fellowship training. The HIC respondents had performed arthroscopy for an average of 25 years, while the LMIC respondents reported an average of 8 years. The recurring themes that came from the interviews were motivations, key ingredients, impacts, metrics of success, and challenges of arthroscopy partnerships. I'm going to discuss some of the most valuable insights I took away from the paper and share some quotes from their interviews. LMIC surgeons were motivated for learning arthroscopy and centered around improving patient cares and improving uh, their skills. They sought to bring arthroscopy to rural areas to expand access to specialty care. Relationships play a large role in the success and sustainability of these partnerships. In addition, multiple trips from the visiting surgeons to the same local site is a key ingredient in starting and maintaining a successful partnership. This builds trust, engagement, and buy-in from both sides. A local LMIC champion who leads the program is critical to the success of the partnership and will be the one who carries on the work before and after the HIC partners leave. Learning new skills and techniques has a positive impact on both operative and non-operative clinical management of injuries and conditions. Learning should be bi-directional from both HIC and LMIC surgeons. Success is measured in many ways, but one marker is developing clinical independence without continued reliance on HIC partners. There are many challenges to establishing arthroscopy, but equipment and implants are a common theme. Continued success of existing sites requires maintenance and upkeep of equipment, including arthroscopy towers. Lack of access to disposable resources such as implants and shavers is often the limiting factor for longitudinal success. It's worth discussing these challenges further. Arthroscopy is unique as the dependence on towers and implants creates a major bottleneck for LMIC surgeons. By 2029, the sports arthroscopy market is estimated to grow to about $8.8 billion, and a majority of the market share is in North America. Where will, where will LMIC hospitals and surgeons get equipment and implants from? Donations have been a large source, but over time, this may not be sustainable. There is no easy fix to the problem, but here are potential solutions. For equipment, one solution could be to train local technicians to f- perform maintenance on arthroscopy towers and troubleshoot solutions. If this is not possible, there could be an exchange of information on platforms such as video calling to have an HIC surgeon or a rep tr- troubleshoot with them and sending parts for me, a North American partners. Another solution to implant access is to modify surgical technique to limit the use of expensive implants. For example, this can include performing inside-out meniscus repairs instead of all inside, using bone tunnels for rotator cuff transosseous repair, and for MPFL reconstruction, using tunnels through the patella with hamstring autograft rather than suture anchors. This is the technique we used in, to do MPFL reconstructions at MOI. 
Another potential solution is turning single-use items into multiple-use items, such as reusing shavers, art devices, and cannulas, which they're already doing at Moy. My co-resident Ellen and Dr. Saberwal just published this review paper on the reuse of orthopedic implants. One discussion point is that reusing items such as shavers can make them dull or have residual proteins left over on the blade even after re-sterilization. However, future research is needed to determine the cl- clinical significance of this. Maybe the answer is obtaining similar implants from outside countries for a lower, for a lower cost. For example, at Moy, for their total knees and hips, they are using MindRay, a device company based in China um, that provide cheaper implants. Could Western industry establish partnerships with nonprofits to donate implants? With their billion dollar market size for sports products, there has to be some room for these companies to give. And why not um, be a way to facilitate this easier? Could we develop a nonprofit sports implant program like Cyanails did for trauma to facilitate sports implant access worldwide? While we work to solve some of these challenges, we can discuss further directions for arthroscopy and LMICs. Future directions include conducting needs assessment survey research and arthroscopy training and techniques of local surgeons, developing and refining resident arthroscopy education, including providing simulation, research for partnerships to study failure rates, infection, validating patient-reported outcome scores, and tracking long-term outcomes in these settings, continuing bi-directional exchange between programs Uh, for sending LMIC residents and attendings to HIC countries, establishing a local sports fellowship for sustainable training of other local surgeons, and finally, improving local healthcare system sustainability through partnerships with the ultimate goal of decolonizing global health and making LMICs self-sufficient. Wrapping up, I wanted to share some of my key takeaways from my experience at Moy. I came in with the preconceived notion that I would mostly be doing orthotrauma surgery. My experience there challenged my perception by seeing the elective practices these exceptional surgeons have created in a low resource setting. Although there's still room for growth, Moy serves as a great example of how other LMIC institutions could build arthroscopy practice. They have local champions who are training their own local and visiting surgeons like an informal fellowship. They seek outside training and continued education. For example, Dr. Amrita is going back to Egypt to learn hip arthroscopy. They are utilizing equipment donations effectively, and they are adapting surgical techniques to fit their resource-constrained environment. By learning from past successes and failures, I do believe that arthroscopy and LMICs will continue to grow, and we can help support this effort. My experience as a visiting resident was overall extremely positive. I learned creative techniques in a resource-constrained setting and made many new friends along the way. The main challenges I faced were navigating a new environment, the language barrier, and getting used to differences in practice and standards of care. Recommendations I would give to future residents going global are approach the experience with an open mind, be flexible, listen, ask questions, and come prepared. Preparation includes talking to previous residents who have rotated through the site, trying to learn some of the local language, and familiarizing yourself with their operative techniques. Having the opportunity to participate in a global rotation as a resident is a unique and life-changing experience. No matter what specialty you go into, you will benefit from a new perspective on orthopedics and medicine. This rotation has been a highlight of my training and time at UCSF, and I hope to return in the future to continue expanding these relationships and advancing sports and arthroscopy education. Uh, Here are my works cited. Now, I would like to thank all of the Moy team for hosting me, including the attendings, Professor Billy Guanga, and the sports team, the residents, registrars, and staff who graciously helped me out, including Innocent, Erasto, and Rahel, the IGOT team, including Maddie McKechnie for organizing my global rotation. I'd also like to thank former residents, Heather Roberts and Hawa Wu, who shared their own grand round slides with me, and Dr. Shear, Wong, and Coughlin for reviewing my talk. I'd like to thank my family for supporting me through my medical journey and my time in Tanzania. And finally, my partner, Nicolina, for all all her support in helping me develop this talk. Asante sana and thank you. All right. 
Thanks, Dr. Flores. That was great. And um, we have some time for questions, comments. Uh, maybe one just to start and um, getting a microphone to Dr. Shearer. So with the sports procedures, I think one thing that's always so important is like the post-op uh, PT course and rehab. And what did you see like for practices like after ACL surgery or other um, of these like soft tissue reconstructive procedures? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I know they had physical therapists around in the hospital that would work with patients um, before going home, but I'm not exactly sure the outpatient capacity for physical therapy. And I think that one paper brought that up as an important point of making sure that there is some capacity for doing post-operative exercises and rehab to make sure that the surgeries are uh, successful. Uh, thanks, Sergio. Great talk. Um, I think this is exactly the kind of experience and sort of thought provoking, you know, talk that we hope comes out of these resident rotations. Um, one kind of like sad thing that I've noticed over the last few years is that there are less and less residents that are choosing to do the global rotation. We sort of have made it optional um, and a lot aren't, aren't choosing it. Um, it. Seems like your experience is really positive. What do you, what do you think is driving that? Can we change that? Um, just wondering what thoughts you have about that. Yeah, I think um, I was always interested in going global right before COVID. I was supposed to go to Ecuador um, on a rotation there um, to learn medical Spanish and work in the hospitals. I think that um, I've seen, I think being like in the generation of residents who pre-COVID had seen residents go global and their positive experience with it. I think that drove me to want to do this experience. So I'm hoping to convince some of the uh, residents in the other classes to go global and uh, experience this firsthand. So yeah, junior residents take notice. <laughs> yeah, questions. <laughs> there, I mean, there may be fa other factors like life events or things that prevent you from taking the time to go, but I really do think it's a once in a lifetime opportunity that may inspire um, you to do future work in this field. Thanks, Sergio. That was great. I have to admit, when I saw your title, I was like, what? <laughs> what? Come on. Um, but you convinced me. I think, you know, you you um, brought up some really interesting points that I hadn't thought of before. And I'd just like to hear your thought on, as we think about some of the newer technologies that we're using um, here in San Francisco, and if you compare, like, the public health good of maybe arthroscopic techniques versus, you know, the total hip or the total knee. We know those are excellent surgeries, very durable. So like, what are your thoughts when you think about, okay, if I have to unroll and really invest in surgical technique for some arthroscopic procedures versus something like a total joint, what's your thought process and what do you think will have the most positive public health impact? That's a great question. Thank you, Dr. Roshak. Um, I, I do, again, like with that elective tier question I, I did struggle with that and seeing like where does arthroscopy fall under these procedures but there are so many young patients who came in with like ACLs who had been so chronic uh, to the point where you know they were damaging their joints and having cartilage injury and meniscus tears that were irreparable and um, I, I just distinctly remember most patients had meniscus tears that we just couldn't fix because they, of their chronicity um, I, I think at least in trauma there are a lot of multi-ligamentous injuries that, you know, do have an ability to fix, you know, walking and doing day-to-day -day activities, especially in a lot of these patients who are manual laborers. Um, so I think investing in um, ligamentous technology, such as, you know, ACL reconstruction to make it affordable. And um, I think that's probably the most advantageous, and especially a young population getting older. Dr. Luke. Uh, thanks, Sergio. Thanks for sharing your experience. And also thanks for being part of the Play Safe program and helping out at Galileo High School. Uh, I really appreciate you kind of bringing up uh, kind of the sports medicine observations that you had, especially with the youth athletes. I was just wondering, just from what you've seen in our program, and I don't know if you got a chance to go see sports or anything going on in the community, is there any opportunities that, uh, you know, we can take some of the ideas we have or where are those big needs that we have for the young athletes out in Africa? Thanks, actually. Yeah, I think um, 
I, I didn't have a chance to kind of experience that firsthand. I mean, sports were playing everywhere. They're playing soccer basically like in every aspect of the city <laughs> um, from on the streets to formal fields. And I think um, like the diagnosis and treatment of these injuries is probably most important. So being able to diagnose uh, ligamentous injuries or meniscus tears or um, things that would prevent an athlete from going back um, to playing is something that uh, could be improved. And so I, I don't know if there's other modalities that we could use, such as ultrasound or um, in the field, you know, uh, on the spot, things that would be helpful to train um, the healthcare providers to, to do instead of spending money like on an MRI or uh, uh, improving exam skills to increase sensitivity of picking up those injuries. Thanks for your talk, Sergio. Uh, I'm just curious from like the patient perspective, were they familiar with these surgical options and was it something like they were excited about or were they more interested in getting like a replacement or like, or just like, are they familiar and um, happy with this access? Yeah, I think a, a lot of patients um, who came in who were getting these sports surgeries had money to be able to pay for them. So I think there was an aspect, you know, even within a low resource setting, there are still disparities in care for people who can afford it. There is like national health insurance that you can purchase and also private insurance, but a lot of patients are uninsured. So I'd, I'd, I I don't know the answer to your question. I think probably a lot of people don't um, understand a lot of like sports injuries and um, the, their electiveness or the desire to to fix their their knee or ligamentous injury so i um i think you know if patients come into clinic they knew something was wrong but they weren't like seeking out surgery as the first option they're kind of just wanting to get a diagnosis but i found that a lot of patients who were able to pay for these surgeries um, wanted to have the procedure done and a lot of the times it was just like even a diagnostic arthroscopy but like physical therapy hadn't worked and they got an MRI that was inconclusive and so they just wanted an answer to find out what's going on. Sergio, I wanted to get a chance to ask a question before our chair puts in his question. Uh, so there are a lot of procedures that are that can be done arthroscopically, but they can be done open, mini open yes. cuff, ACL reconstruction, ALT kind of things. Um, in these in the environment that you're talking about, um, does it change the kind of percentage of patients who would be getting care is it is it better to do two open mini open cuff repairs if you could do those for the same cost as one arthroscopic cuff repair with with anchors or whatever how do you balance that and is are there enough services available that everybody with a cuff repair can be fixed right now what's what's the rate limiting step and how does introducing introduction of new technologies change change that balance yeah, thanks, Dr. Kim. Um, I, I do think that um, there is a role still for open surgery. I think like patients um, who have rotator cuff tears, I, at least I was there, I didn't see any being fixed. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do with the availability of implants. So whether they were um, seeking arthroscopic versus open surgery, I think uh, a lot of the surgeons um, there didn't have access to the to those specific implants like suture anchors or um you know but i didn't see them doing like transosseous repairs either which is definitely an option so um yeah i'm not exactly sure what uh the limiting factor for that would be but i think that providing education for someone who maybe they or an older patient who dislocated the shoulder who definitely have a acute tear they may not know that something's wrong that needs to be surgically fixed um so improving like diagnosis i think is probably the most important step um of getting these patients in to be in to be seen but i think there is definitely capacity for this to be done uh, there's plenty of surgeons there who, who could perform that surgery okay uh, so so you um, um thank you for sharing your experience and also understanding what the needs are and the rest of the world I'm kind of intrigued about your suggestion about making cheaper implants and also with the success of like the sign and, you know, other, you know, in mind, say the Chinese company in terms of that, looking at what's a barrier right now to do like a sign for arthroscopy equipment? You know, I think that, you know, what the, maybe that what the success was and, and how could we actually 
you know, kind of support that type of activities because clearly we know that uh, like a little rotating up anchors should not be a couple hundred dollars. You know, I think, yeah. you know, I think some of you have seen me actually use buttons, actually little these like um, the shirt button I actually put, you know, <laughs> on my shirt over there. I actually said fix my ACL. I think some of the people have this in the, in the knees right now and they lose like a dollar fifty, right? So, mm-hmm. um, so um, well, what's a barrier uh, and how do we actually overcome that? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Ma. I, I think because global or global health in orthopedics specifically has focused mostly on trauma. I just think it's an untapped field that hasn't really been explored as heavily. And, um, back to your point about implants, I think it's just the industry that's driving the the cost and whether that's fair or not, I'm not probably the one to be able to say that, but, um, there, there has to be some way to lower the price of these implants and, and either make tax breaks or programs that we're able to sign, send implants or have them be able to purchase these for for a cheaper amount of money and i'm, I'm not exactly sure about the history of sign maybe dr Shear can speak about it a little bit more um but um, it seems like they had to observe the need and then they came up with a solution and i think we're kind of starting now to observe this need and we need to come up with a solution um by working with implant companies or outside companies to make these implants more affordable and accessible Oh, Dave, you want to comment? Well, obviously, Dave Shu is actually one of the you know, leaders within the sign organization and have made a lot of impact globally. I, mean, I think, what is the barrier, Dave, in terms of, you know, obviously, we identify some of needs. How do we help with these you know, activities um, that we could actually use in a world? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think sign's a pretty unique model. Um, they basically, for those that don't know, they are, they manufacture, you know, predominantly nails for long bone fractures in Eastern Washington of all places. Um, and then donate them for free all around the world. And they've done, I don't know, 300,000 nails or something around the world, all in sort of lower middle income countries. Um, you can imagine it's like, a, <clears throat> it's very effective that, you know, in terms of the nails are designed to be used without all the fancy equipment and fluoroscopy and power tools, but it's very expensive. I mean, you know, still talking like a hundred dollars a nail, so, and it's based on philanthropy. So, you know, it's not like probably the long-term sustainable solution to implant supply. It's sort of like, uh, I think I view it as a short-term thing that hopefully over time there will be local markets that can sustain implant supply that's manufactured. And I think the real solutions probably are going to be manufactured in places like China and India that um, can, you know, have high quality manufacturing, but at a far lower cost than the United States. And we're seeing that a lot already in a lot of, um, a lot of trauma implants, the total knee replacements that uh, Serge is talking about. I'm not sure what, you know, I'm sure there are, are suture anchors as well uh, manufactured. That's probably going to be the solution. Science really focused mostly on trauma, although um, you can imagine there's just a, an unlimited list of implants that they could manufacture. And so it's always kind of trying to prioritize what, where should they invest those limited um, donor dollars for making a new implant and if it requires new manufacturing equipment, that's a whole other investment and things like that. So anyway, those, those are kind of the barriers I think for sign doing it, but I think probably local manufacturing, um, not local, but lower cost manufacturing is probably a more realistic solution for implant supply issues. But also just comment that one of the interesting dynamics with sports surgery and, and LMICs is that, um, the surgeons, you know, the trauma pay, everyone takes care of trauma. Um, but a lot of the trauma patients can't pay. And as, as has been mentioned, a lot of the sports cases, they are paying patients, um, which you sort of think, oh, this is really taking away from like the real need, which is trauma. But in fact, actually, it actually helps a lot of these surgeons, um, support their, um, trauma practice. They wouldn't be able to afford to take care of the trauma patients if they didn't have these practices. There's like a lot of interesting indirect uh, benefits, I think, of developing these um, these practices and other areas. So it's easy to kind of from afar, you know, make judgments about things. But I think, in fact, um, it really is a overall very positive thing for them to develop these um, skills and, and practices. So, um, one other, so there was a, there's an arthroscopy technique article recently on, um, develop, or they describe, uh, like a suture record that you can make just in the OR, um, uh, from like low middle income countries. Uh, but, um, I can find that, but, um, it's just with suture, you can make an all suture implant. 
Okay. Uh, so you can cut out like a lot of the uh, pre-manufactured cost and be able to just replicate it on hand pretty easily. That's great. So things like that could also be like a nice solution to um, but I think with that, uh, we're right at 8.30. So Dr. Flores, thank you so much. And thank you all for being here.